I'm Jessica Philippe. I'm the Educational Services Librarian at South Central Regional Library Council in Ithaca, New York. And Mary Carol Lindblom, the Executive Director of SCRLC, is here with us as well. And she'd like to say a few words to introduce this webinar series. So good morning, Mary Carol. Good morning, Jessica. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'll give a special shout out to Tina and Amanda that I saw um, when I was scrolling through the attendees and, and to everyone. I'll turn the mic back over to Jessica in a moment to introduce our presenters. But first, a word about our sponsoring organization, the NY3Rs Association, Inc. Today's webinar is a part of a continuing series called Practical Library Assessment. And Practical Library Assessment is a part of the Assessment and Outcomes Initiative funded by the NY3Rs organization which represents the nine multi-type library systems of New York State. So for more information about us and to see our other initiatives, visit www.ny3rs.org. And you may also check on that website or your local 3Rs councils for information about upcoming webinars in this series. The previously recorded webinars are available on the NY3R's um, website on their YouTube channel. And I'm the canary in the coal mine. And I had challenges finding them yesterday. You can reach them through South Central's um, website as well. I think it's under recent presentations that there would be a link. And uh, that's www.scrlc. Org. I will mention a couple of assessment events um, that are upcoming in November. Um, one is on data visualization, and that's a webinar that Liz Beth Chabot, um, Chabot of Ithaca College will present, and that's on November 16th. And we actually have an in-person event at Fayetteville Free Library, which is outside of Syracuse. And um, that is on November 13th. This is going to be a provocative conversation about assessment. And Jim Honan from Harvard's Graduate School of Education will be leading that conversation. We're also going to be talking about the NY 3Rs and really the New York State Assessment Plan. And so um, stay tuned for registration information on that. And we expect to schedule surveys and focus groups for December. If there are pieces of assessment that you still need, please let us know on the evaluation form. So now I am going to turn back the program to Jessica to introduce Sue and Nancy. So if you have any questions for the speakers today, I just want to let you know you can type those into the question area of the command module and our speakers will be answering all questions at the end of their talk. So I'd like to welcome our speakers. We have Sue Considine, the Executive Director of the Fayetteville Free Library, and Nancy Greco, who is the Access Services Librarian at St. John Fisher College's Lavery Library. So welcome, Sue and Nancy. Thank you. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for making the time in your busy day. I'm Sue Considine here with Nancy Greco. Good morning, everyone. We have about 40 minutes of content to share with you, after which we'll have Q&A. So what we ask of all of you is please log all of your questions, thoughts, and ideas into chat as we move forward, and we will regroup at the end. So today, Nancy and I hope that participants will review the pros and cons of tools you know and some you don't, learn ways to involve everyone on your team in daily data gathering, examine strategies for capturing information, and discover strategies for effectively sharing your story. I think we can all agree that one of our universal challenges throughout our industry is our difficult difficulty telling our stories effectively. Our challenge in this area is evident. Our users and patrons do not necessarily understand our value. Our stakeholders question our relevance. Our budgets are not sufficient to meet or ideally to exceed our aspirations. And our energies are often focused on explaining 
in defending our deficits rather than leveraging our assets. Our data is not doing us justice. While our purely qual quantitative data sets can be misleading or problematic, particularly when taken out of context, our stories may be better told through st strategic collection and sharing of qualitative data. Outcomes and impacts in our communities on our campus and on our campuses. Evidence of individual lives made better. The qualitative, qualitative and quantitative need to synergize to best tell our stories. So let's review very briefly the differences uh, between qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, qualitative data uh, can be used to discover underlying reasons, opinions, and motivations from the customer's point of view. It allows the customers to express to us exactly uh, how they feel and what they have observed and how they have participated with your library. Um, it should provide a deeper understanding into a problem. Um, as, uh, Participants in the qualitative data can be uh, can give us a deeper understanding and give us more information so that we can uh, provide a means of developing a hypothesis and a solution. Uh, however, atlas or excuse me, analysis may require some expertise. Um, you'll want to understand uh, coding, for instance and uh, being able to categorize the responses of our participants in order to understand exactly um, and to, come, to draw some conclusions. So one of the free resources that we use um, is Atlas TI, or excuse me, one of the resources we use um, is Atlas TI. It's a software program that helps us to uh, code and categorize some of the responses from participants. There is a free version online if you're interested in taking a look at that particular software, although it, is, um, it can be rather costly. But some of the expertise can be found um, more locally. We have uh, librarians who do have some background in social sciences who have done research in the past who can help us with uh, that uh, coding and categorizing aspect of qualitative data. We also have folks on campus that have this expertise as well who can assist us. And that's certainly about um, public libraries might be at a slight disadvantage. However, I'm sure there are constituencies out there that can help them as well. And quantitative data, it's more of that traditional data that we've been collecting all along. The numerical data that can be transformed into usable statistics. Um, so it helps us to collect those facts and see patterns and, and trends. Um, and it's very easy to collect and visualize. But how much is it really telling us about the folks who come through our libraries day in and day out and what they really feel about um, the services that we're providing? So uh, Sue and I are really interested particularly in this idea of qualitative data, data in its two forms. Uh, the formal qualitative data that we probably have had the opportunity to capture in, in one way or another, the things that we, that we use as tools day to day um, that we turn to more frequently. The formal aspects of surveys, interviews, focus groups, that suggestion box that everyone seems to have, or perhaps a comment board, um, the tangible sorts of things that we can turn to and um, uh, try to gather information in those ways. But we're really rather interested in that informal information that's far more difficult to capture, that elusive information that people uh, hear but do not necessarily record in a systematic way. So the informal aspects would be our observations of what's happening in our library, overhearing people talk. We, we, we overhear what our, our um, constituencies are talking about all the time. And also those random comments that people make to us via a quick um, chat in the hall or at, in passing, or uh, via an email or a quick phone call. Uh, we have that sort of information as well. So what do we do with that kind of information? So um, 
there are pros and cons to some of the, the tools that we have used in the past. Surveys and focus groups, I'm just going to give you a few little aspects of um, survey and focus group pros and cons, because it seems like those are the things that we turn to all the time. So of course, uh, with surveys, the pros would be that it can be very inexpensive, especially if you create something homegrown, something that you've made, and you can target that information pretty closely to a problem at hand. So I can decide, I want to find out information about a specific problem that I have, and it's very easy to put together a homegrown uh, survey that will address that particular problem. Uh, you can also uh, gather information from large numbers of people in this manner. And uh, if you're able to use a standardized survey, uh, those are considered uh, very reliable. However, on the converse, uh, the con of the standardized survey is the fact that they are, can be very cost prohibitive. It can be very costly. Uh, some of the common ones that we have, we're familiar with here in academia would be uh, tools like LibQual, Sales, Head, MISO. I believe Trails is used in the K through 12 environment. Um, MISO is maybe you're not familiar with that one. It's used. We had um, MISO survey here on our campus. It's the Measuring Information Services Outcome Survey. Uh, that was interesting. It gave us a, a good amount of information. But as I said, these can be costly, and unless your entire institution um, is supporting this, sometimes it, that can be difficult to find the funding to do that. And also, also expertise is needed to develop effective questions. Um, oftentimes, you uh, create a question which you think is perfect, but quickly into the survey, you discover it's not really giving me the information that I wanted, and you would like to be able to manipulate that question. But once the survey is started, you really can't change that once it's begun. Um, sampling bias is important as well, especially for libraries. We can capture our users and our advocates. But how about those folks out there who don't use our library? Those folks are really uh, difficult to capture in a survey if for whatever reason they are not interested in interacting with the library. And of course, those are time consuming. And when it comes to uh, focus groups, they're wonderful because you can hear exactly in their own words what people think. Uh, so you can get a, a deeper understanding of those opinions. Um, they can generate fresh ideas, things that perhaps people had never even thought of. And if you didn't think of it, you wouldn't have put it on your survey question. Um, so it allows participants to clarify the answers. Group members can stimulate one another. And it can generate goodwill, because you're bringing in folks who, who um, can then offer their opinions. And uh, they know that you're interested in what they have to say. But also, there are cons to that as well, so time consuming, obviously. Lack of anonymity. So when you're working in this focus group, are they tr truly um, giving us candid answers if it's not anonymous? Um, the lack of confidentiality is a problem. Group dynamics. We've always been, we've all, all of us have been in a focus group where there's one person who seems to dominate the conversation. And the rest of the crowd kind of shakes their head and uh, don't feel comfortable perhaps give, offering um, a different perspective. So uh, also, the people who are conducting the interview may bias uh, the responses, so kind of lead people in a particular direction. And this da data, being qua qualitative, as we talked about before, can be difficult to analyze. OK, so how about that informal data? Well, to me, this is the type of data that is of the show me or tell me a story variety. Qualitative data can be as simple as collecting that love note or breakup note from your community of users to the more complex collection of data using various tools that address questions like, what's working? What's not? What aren't patrons or customers using and why? Was a skill gained? Was knowledge shared? Was new knowledge created? So some um, informal methods for gathering this type of data include conversations in service areas, out in the community, out on the campus, 
feedback through blogs, websites, and social media. One example from the Fayetteville Free Library that we use to informally capture information is our Capturing Stories form. And basically, this uh, form is the tool that allows the entire team, everyone in the organization at the Fayetteville Free Library, the opportunity to capture uh, feedback and, and stories as they're receiving it. So for instance, if I'm a circulation clerk and I'm working at the circulation desk and a patron comes in and excitedly shares that because that person um, came to the library and was able to access job and career resource information and uh, to practice their interview skills and uh, to get help on their resume, that person landed the interview or even better, got the job. When we hear something like that, our team is trained to not only feel really great about, about that accomplishment and about what we've been able to support, but take it one step further and ask the patron, you know, this is exciting, uh, this, this information is so valuable to us, can we capture your story? And we can either give the patron the piece of paper and they can write it down themselves, we can write it down, we can videotape them, if they don't want to be a camera, we can podcast them, but uh, this very simple tool allows the entire team to get involved in this type of informal data capturing in, in a pretty simple way. Um, some more formal methods to capture qualitative data include things like satisfaction surveys, as Nancy was talking about, skills audits of the community. Uh, for example, on the screen here is a very simple uh, six-question um, patron survey that we utilize at the Fayetteville Free Library in our fabrication lab. And uh, question number one is that, are you satisfied question. Question number two is that, did you gain a skill? Question number three, if you had concerns, were they met? Were they addressed? Number four for us is critically important um, in terms of qualitative evidence. And uh, this question basically is saying, what do you plan to do with what you've learned, with what you've gained? This information is critically important for us when we want to justify budgets, uh, for growth in the area uh, of, of service, whatever it might be. This is evidence for us that's uh, extremely powerful. And then five and six help us to understand if we're messaging appropriately. Do people know about this opportunity? Where are they learning about this opportunity to come into the public library and access uh, the, the tools of fabrication, et cetera? So uh, just a quick example, uh, simple questions that give us exactly the type of information that we need in, in a very uh, qualitative, tell us your story type of way. So who should participate in this informal data gathering? Well, as I mentioned, I think both Nancy and I agree, the entire team, everyone, everyone in an organization should be a participant. In, in data collection. It should be on everyone's radar. The entire team needs to be involved. But most importantly, before you start down this path with your entire organization, you have to bring people on board and up to speed. You have to start with the what. What data will be collected, informal, formal data, et cetera, like we've been talking about for the last few minutes. Number two is the how. How is this data going to be collected? So the tools, both formal and informal, need to be clear and, and explained and uh, easy to access for everyone. Uh, training, if necessary, needs to be provided um, on an ongoing basis. And any processes that will be involved with that collection of data need to be explained clearly and fully to everyone on the team. Number three is the why. Why is this data being collected? What are we hoping to learn? It's important for everyone to understand why we're pursuing this. Why are we going through this exercise? Why are we spending our time and our resources in collecting this data? Which leads to the, again, another what. What's going to happen with this data? If people on your team across the organization understand what's going to happen with the data, you'll have a much better engagement, I think, from the entire team in collecting that data. It could be 
anything from your annual report, summer reading reports, budget support for innovations and growth, advocacy, community awareness, whatever it is, be sure that your team understands what's going to happen with this information once we collect it. And uh, ultimately, uh, both for buy-in, um, it's critical. Uh, be seen using that data. Be seen using it. Make it clear through your actions that there's value in this process and each team member's participation with it. So uh, getting started with qualitative data collection, the following areas are key. Sharing the importance of gathering the data as we discussed. Make it a priority to bring the team together around the why before the process is launched. Changing mindsets, all in. Everyone has conversations, receives feedback, and, uh, and more every day. And this is uh, of immense value, and it will be the key to a satisfactory result. Training, assure your team that they will have all the tools and, cl and clear processes that they need to be successful. Reinforcement. Check in often, both with individuals and the team. What's working, what's not, what's easy, what's not. Sharing once you, what you've learned in-house and with the outside world. Once again, be seen using the data. The team's captured data uh, involve the team in imagining new ways to share results. Invest time and resources in careful and predictable messaging to your community, utilizing the data and the evidence that your team has worked so hard to collect. Okay, so how can we capture that informal qualitative data that we've been describing? By its nature, it is not in any tangible form. Uh, once we have uh, buy-in from our staff, from everybody on the team, and we have addressed those what and why issues, then how can we go move forward and capture this data in some way that is manageable and accessible so that we can then turn around and use it as we had talked about before. Okay, so here's one method and we're certainly open to suggestions from folks out there who have practiced this already perhaps and have other ways in which they have been able to capture this qualitative informal data. But here is one example. Um, this is how we gather this information here at Lavery Library, St. John Fisher College. Uh, we have a Google form in which we collect all sorts of data, formal, informal, qualitative, and quantitative. It's all in one place and very easily accessible. Uh, there's a, a URL that gets everybody on staff to the form so that they can fill the form out. And as you can see under Lavery staff fiscal year 16, we describe it as one form to rule them all. And in fact, that's, um, we addressed this because there was frustration among the staff about, I don't, I don't remember, am I supposed to put the qualitative data here and the quantitative data there, and where do we put the classroom data, and where do we put the anecdotal data. So we decided um, all of this is information that we can use and it should all come from one place. And you'll notice on that form we have a specific um, entry for anecdotal. And we did this, we left it as a separate category because what we discovered was although um, we had areas within the form where people could add in anecdotal information, um, or comments, what would happen is that people would come back later on to um, express their thanks or express um, maybe um, a way we can improve something, but it wasn't until a few days later and we couldn't get back into that form easily to add the comment in. So we decided, well, we should have a spot where you can just add in the anecdotal data and it can be connected later on to whatever uh, event or um, uh, practice that was going on at the time. So we use that anecdotal data section to capture those comments we hear in passing, that quick email that someone sent, sent etc. 
um, talking about something that maybe happened a little bit ago. So we use uh, an enormous Google form to do that. And we'll show you a couple more screenshots from that Google form. So this is, you can see, it's just an open comment box. And someone could uh, use that in any way they wanted to. They can talk about the interaction with the person and maybe what the person said. You can simply cut and paste the email right into the box. So it's very user friendly and uh, people have flexibility to enter information in whatever way they choose. But the important part is that it gets recorded. So um, just to take away, record it in, an, in any way that you can do that. And you can see here that it's important to add who was it that collected this data. So this is a list of every single staff member here at the library. Um, and right down to a checkbox for a student worker. If a student worker happened to hear the comment, that they can also check that box as well. Uh, and you can check as many as apply. So let's say we're a group of folks just walking to lunch, and a faculty member stopped us and said how much they enjoyed an event. All three of us can check that box and, and say that we all interacted with someone, and they told us. Um, something um, of value that we can share with with others. So, so when, once you've gathered the information and you use a Google form, the great part is that it puts everything into a, a giant spreadsheet. So you can see all the various questions that someone could respond to um, in using that Google form, and it's really easy then to sort okay, what am I looking for? I'm looking for anecdotal evidence that has to do with um, maybe a class and some information literacy aspect of um, our standards that was addressed during that class. You can uh, sort this spreadsheet in any way necessary for you to be able to gather that information and use it later on. So this is really important, the ease with which to gather that information to be able to sort it and use it later for whatever purpose um, you might have. Um, I don't manage this enormous spreadsheet, but we do have an assessment librarian who is in charge of that. So she gets a lot of questions from all of us as we're out and about doing our business. Um, Christina, can you quickly gather? this information for me, and um, she is able to do that too sweet, and we have the information we can go on from there. So how would we use this information uh, in order to tell our story? And there's lots of different ways and tools. So certainly, uh, we're welcome to feedback from all of you. I'm sure you guys have some ideas that maybe we don't use or hadn't thought to present here, but please share. Uh, here are a few things that we have used, both in the public library and in, ac in the academic uh, world. We, we share these in common, I think. Uh, perhaps we use them somewhat differently in our presentation methods, uh, but certainly all of us can use dashboards, infographics, websites, our annual reports, some are prettier than others. Um, in the media, both social and otherwise. He, um, if there's a school newspaper, we try to interact with those folks as well uh, during presentations and, of course, those elusive elevator speeches. Here's an example of the dashboard that we have at Lavery Library. Um, it collects information through that um, enormous Google form that we were talking about, that spreadsheet. Our uh, assessment librarian weekly gathers that information and um, inputs the information into the dashboard. So you'll have information on all of our five strategic initiatives. So the dashboard will show you the uh, various um, data that we've collected under the various strategic initiatives that we have. So we have five different hashtags that we use. Um, in order to express that out to the folks um, that are that are viewing our dashboard. And uh, for publics, um, check out Skokie Public Library's dashboard for internal communications for stakeholders, an excellent example that uh, you might find of interest. 
Um, infographics are a really great way to visualize and depict information. Uh, this is a page from our annual report. There are lots of different infographic tools that can help you to create fancy pages. I listed a few over on the left there under infographics. Um, there's PictoChart, Easily, Visually, and Canva are a few that I'm aware of. And certainly, if you know of more, please share with one another. We always um, are interested in learning about new tools. But most of them are fairly easy to use. This particular example on the page is a page from our annual report. And it combines um, both text, uh, uh, infographic images throughout, uh, visualizing some of the data that we have to share. We have photographs from the library, and also comments, commentary, and quotes from um, our students and faculty and so on. So we kind of um, gathered all of that sort of information together in one place in our annual report. And for Publix, um, specifically, Nancy has two here that um, we know are either no or low cost and have a very low learning curve. You may not have that capacity on your staff, either that position or that time, for someone who you know, has skills in these areas. So um, don't be afraid to use infographics. And do be aware that both PictoChart and Easily are low cost and a very low learning curve, very I accessible. I think all three are free to some extent, um, but if you wanted to use it in a more sophisticated manner, usually they have an upgrade um, at a small cost. Yeah. So uh, don't be afraid uh, out of the gate that that uh, this isn't um, uh, a tool that you can use because of the cost or because of the learning curve. You know, speaking as a public library administrator, I am intimately aware that we don't necessarily have this type of either time or um, uh, uh, capacity on our staff. So uh, don't be afraid. Give it a try. So uh, websites. This is an example of the St. John Fisher College's Educational Effectiveness Assessment homepage. And the entire campus has ad adopted a culture of assessment. And we have modeled what we present to the public after the NILOA, the National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment Transparency Framework. So that transparency framework helps institutions to evaluate the extent to which they are making evidence of student accomplishments readily accessible. So you can go to that web page, and they have um, a lot of information there for you, and you can uh, learn from them ways to make this information accessible. We really espouse to the theory that this needs to be made public. People need to be able to see how we're doing. So you can see information from each school, and this includes the library and our information literacy assessment that we've been doing with our first year program is readily available to the uh, public. So we, the ELT committee is on campus. So that would be the Educational Assessment Leadership Team. They manage this website. And they collect the, all of the assessment plans, outcomes, and results from assessments from each school and make those publicly available. So parents can see what we're doing. Um, our board can see how we're doing. Uh, it's really important that the assessments that you're doing are uh, publicly available and uh, that people can see that we are making this really important effort to see how our students are doing. So annual reports. I am so pleased to say that our annual report, which is entitled 2014 Lavery Library DNA is the winner of the 2015 ALA PR Exchange Award for the best annual report for small for the small colleges library uh, category. Uh, what makes it really special is that it was created by the Prima Group of St. John Fisher College. It's a real marketing and advertising agency comprised of marketing and communication students and a faculty advisor. 
So the process was very unique. Um, we provided information, um, and they, the pre interviewed us, and they interviewed students, faculty, and staff across campus about their feelings about the library. Um, so the annual report, our annual report, is a little fancy. It includes photographs, infographics, and quotes um, scattered throughout. And you can see one of the quotes there from one of our students. And uh, yes, they are available. And yes, you may hire them if you wish. They've done a wonderful job. So it's really important to us. And I think what we're proud of is that it's our own students who did this work and came up with this fabulous product. A little bit of a different perspective from a public library perspective. Um, unlike Nancy, I, I'm not necessarily very excited about um, the annual reports that we uh, traditionally submit to the state um, on an annual basis. Um, much of the um, qualitative data that we collect uh, should be put into a local um, report in some glossy, pretty, um, uh, easy to read format for your public. Um, but the data that we submit in our annual report to the state should uh, complement that more quantitative data, should complement that qualitative data that we've been talking about for, for the last uh, many minutes. Um, so for publics out there, annual reports to the state, it, it's time for a revolution. What we should be asking is, what does success look like in public libraries? And then the question becomes, does our annual report address this? And um, I can confidently say that no, it does not. So a, just a suggested action here, we all need to agitate for a way to influence or change the data that is collected for our state report in the public arena. Um, we should all encourage the state to step up and work in a systematic, collaborative way to develop new measures that focus on impact and outcomes. And we would like an end goal and a timeline for this work to be done. Some work currently being done um, to address this effort uh, nationally includes the PLA Gates-funded Project Outcomes, IMLS's Shaping Outcomes, and the Community Indicators Project. So uh, if you're interested, you know, you can find all of these uh, projects and all of this activity easily online. Um, I suggest we all look into this and bring uh, discussion points back to our state associations, our state libraries, and keep this dialogue going. Our data is not doing us justice. So the media, and it seems more and more these days when we talk about the media, we're talking about social media. So we keep up with uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, although it seems to me, and I don't know if everyone out there concurs, that Facebook is probably waning a bit. Um, but we find that our students use Instagram consistently. So whenever we send out a message, we make sure that we hit all of three of those social media so we capture as many people as we possibly can. Uh, the image that you see um, is a Facebook posting, but that it did go out through Twitter and Instagram as well. It's during our freshman orientation day that we had all our freshmen in the library doing a scavenger hunt. And while they were doing their scavenger hunt, our um, student advisors were uh, uh, manning the DJ. They were being DJs. So we had music blaring, and everyone has, was having a great time. And I thought it was very amusing that we captured one student as she commented as she was leaving the library saying to her friend, I don't want to leave the library. And I thought, oh my goodness, this, I'm so glad that we have this avenue to share that out. Um, so Facebook is really important, uh, Twitter and Instagram, making sure that people know what's going on in the library and the sorts of things that we hear. But we also make sure that our communication department here on campus knows about every event, every award, every con conference participation. Um, so our media folks, our communication folks here on campus, touch on the various other media avenues. Um, there's a, campus-wide Facebook account 
There's also uh, the college uh, news and notes, which are which is published by our communication department. And she, if we make sure that she's abreast of what we're doing, she's more than happy to uh, send it out through her avenues as well. Um, her biggest lament is that people just don't tell her what's going on. Mm -hmm. So it's really important um, to touch all of those bases. Make sure you communicate with all of those avenues that can assist you there. And uh, social media is equally important in our messaging in, in the public arena as well. As Nancy mentioned, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, critically important. E-newsletters are uh, really a, a powerful way to keep um, uh, sharing that information, uh, uh, pushing our brand out there, and uh, making sure that we're um, not only engaging with those who already are aware of uh, opportunities and uh, the good stuff that's going on at the library, but to cast that net a little wider. Um, digit, for us, um, digital signage within the library is a really powerful way to uh, uh, do uh, random shout outs about things that are happening, uh, great activities happening with the staff, um, uh, all kinds of different things. And an, uh, one of the newest things that we piloted at our library is this iBeacon technology, really good stuff. Uh, we we work with Bluebeam. It's B L U U B E A M, and uh, what these iBeacons do essentially is uh, allow information to be fed directly into your mobile device um, uh, wherever you are. Whether you're pulling up in your car to the library, or just driving through the library parking lot to drop a book into the book drop, or say you're coming into the library for a specific reason. Say, for instance, you're going to bring your child to a children's program, but when you come through the doors, these beacons pop into your phone and uh, let you know about other things that are happening in the library that you may not be aware of. So it's, a, it's uh, been an um, incredibly uh, powerful uh, tool for us, and uh, I would suggest uh, you know, give it a try. Uh, one thing that we did that helped build awareness about this particular um, uh, technology and this opportunity was by incentivizing the download of the free app. You got to download the app to be able to get the beacons on your phone. So, for instance, we have a cafe in our library, so you know we give you a free punch on your coffee card if you download the app. Um, uh, that type of thing. And uh, don't forget to take every opportunity that you have to share what you've learned with that right audience. So matching the audience to the message is really important. Match those talking points um, with the particular folks that you're talking with at that, at that time. Uh, for instance, we did have a standardized survey that we uh, presented to our students. It was called the Higher Education Data Sharing Consortium Survey, HEADS is the acronym, H-E-D-S. And one of the things that we learned was that 50% of freshman students ask their parents for help with their research. Um, so I don't know about you, and I'm not sure about the parents out there and how recently they've done research. It seems to me that um, they would be better served if they um, spoke with a librarian instead. So during summer orientation, we had those parents as captive audience during a presentation for the parents of new students. So we provided this data to them and ask them to um, encourage their student to come talk with a librarian um, rather than getting in research information from their parents. So you can see how it's really important. This was only one question on the head survey, uh, but we learned a lot through that one question and we can share it directly with the folks who could help us then to help those students. And piggybacking on what Nancy is talking about, leveraging these presentations for, from a public library perspective, uh, think of all the unique audiences that, that we serve um, on a daily basis. Uh, you may um, have identified that early literacy um, instruction and programming is, is of great value to your community. So when you're in front of those parents, you know, share with them the research that the library 
has done uh, to uh, craft and uh, develop uh, programs that, that meet their needs and uh, you know, arm those parents and, and those grandparents and those caregivers with knowledge so they feel uh, better informed and leave the library with the feeling that if not for the library, I wouldn't have the confidence uh, that I have now uh, um, to uh, help my child or my charge on, on their, their educational journey. Uh, another area that's, I think, uh, critically important is uh, there's a lot of informal learning uh, development happening in the public library arena on all of our platforms. And uh, STEM learning uh, is, is critically important, and it's becoming more and more important for us to be thinking about um, incorporating STEM learning, STEAM learning into all of our offerings. So um, something as simple as involving teens in, in, uh, in the exploration of where your library might, might take this journey, um, do a quick survey for teens only. Ask them if you had $1,000 to spend on a STEAM program in, in, in the library, what would it look like and why? And uh, it will engage them and it will tell, uh, it'll tell you a lot. And finally, the infamous elevator speeches. So providing those talking points to the entire staff whenever you expect to be in contact with your constituencies. So you don't, don't expect everyone to be good at this. Uh, we're certainly not all extroverts. But if you give, everyone's, give, give everyone a heads up, it makes it easier for those introverts on staff to start a conversation. So this is an example of an email that our director sent out to the entire staff, kind of uh, giving them some talking points. These are things that someone should ask you about the library. Hey, maybe you might want to bring up one or two of these things. So certainly putting folks on alert, giving them a little bit of comfort in knowing that I've got a few things in my pocket that I can talk about if I should run into somebody, especially if you know there's going to be an event where uh, large groups of people will be gathering and there'll be some social aspect to it where we'll be mixing and mingling with folks. Um, it's always a good idea to kind of provide um, a, a, a list of things that maybe you can bring up. I kind of do that for myself, but other folks might not think of it and providing that to everybody um, is really a good way to uh, spark conversation out there um, in, in social environments. And that um, the listening part of that elevate, elevator speech interaction is, is critically important as well. Um, pointing you back to the capturing stories slide from earlier, um, give your team those tools that they need to have those bullet points in mind to start the conversation, but uh, remind them it's equally important to listen hard to the responses. That, that you're receiving, and um, uh, that information is, is truly valuable, and please capture it in a systematic way, because that, that's the information that helps us to move forward. So the listening piece is equally important. So that concludes our formal part of this uh, presentation. We welcome now your questions, ideas, and contributions, and we'll um, we'll open it up to Jessica, I believe, who will facilitate the questions. Sure, yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. So we've had a couple of questions so far. Amanda was asking, do you think your capturing stories form has a bias toward positive stories, or do you use it to capture stories of patrons who come in and complain to? Oh, we use it for everything. Like like I said, we're we're equally interested in the breakup note <laughs> as well as the as the love note. Um, the capturing stories could be something as uh, simple as identifying a trend with a difficulty with a building issue. You know, say there's a a, a a step out the front door that people are tripping over over and over and over again, and they're mentioning that when they come to the desk. You know, that's something that we're now, through that Capturing Stories um, tool, we're kind of tuned in to things that are, are a pattern or um, uh, uh, things that, um, uh, that, are, that are coming up more than once that we need to be turning our attention to. So it could be something extremely powerful and wonderful, like landing the interview or getting the job as a result of interacting with the library, something as mundane as, oh, gee, we really have to fix that step to something as uh, um, uh, 
disturbing and, and important to pursue, like, uh, geez, you've moved everything in the fiction area, and no one consulted me, and, you know, I don't recognize my library anymore, you're not thinking about me. Those are some, that's a, a, a very recent example of some feedback that we received that we really needed to pay attention to, and if, and if we hadn't, as a team, understood that, listen hard, this is important, capture it, share it, so that we can, uh, you know, address it and move forward. Mm -hmm. And Annie was asking if you would be able to share a URL for the Skokie Library page that you mentioned. Um, I actually, I don't, I don't have it here handy, but if you go to the, uh, just, just Google Skokie Public Library and um, uh, go right to their um, uh, main page, uh, you should be able to find it there. When I get back, to Syracuse this afternoon. I'll look it up. And um, uh, Jessica, th these slides are, are going to be available um, somewhere. Maybe I could uh, yeah. link to that there as well. Sure, yeah. If you want to insert them in the slides or just keep it separate, I will be sending out a link to the recording in the slides. Excellent. I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Um, I see that Stacy Person has her hand raised. Um, let me see if I can unmute you, Stacy. Go ahead, Stacy. Did you have a question? Okay, well, if anybody else has a question, they can type it into the chat box. So I'm interested in your state report revolution. I think that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering Yay. what the, <laughs> I'm wondering what the <laughs> next steps will be for that. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah. I, I do. Once again, you know, it, it, uh, this revolution will only happen if we're all kind of in it together. Mm -hmm. And we can't be voices in the wilderness. And uh, we all feel exactly the same way mm -hmm. about the, the, the state annual report. From, and, and I can only speak from a you know, public library perspective. And um, that's the data that, that we point to, that the state points to, that our stakeholders can easily access. And it honestly does not tell our stories. And uh, we know that um, in order to continue to um, show our relevance um, to all of our stakeholders, we need to be reporting out about outcomes and impact, impact, evidence of our impact in the community on a daily basis. So for instance, in a public library arena, um, uh, say you have a makerspace in, in your library, and um, say that it's uh, in, in three short years, you've certified over 3,000 people on uh, equipment, fabrication equipment, um, supporting community-based manufacturing and discovery and invention and entrepreneurship. This is incredibly important information, and, and it il illustrates a, a tremendous community impact. But how do I capture that and, and put that into the, into the state report? Sure, I can, I can add a note. But it doesn't tell our story, and um, you know, and that's just one, you know, very small example. But um, the face of librarianship, the face of public library service, is has has changed so uh, quickly and so dramatically, and our our issues are are so much more complex, and and and, and hard work needs to go into diving into our data sets and understanding what's of value today to report out and what's just not. And um, I would argue there's a lot of data in, in, our, in, in what we gather and what we report out to our stakeholders that is really ha has, has no value and does not tell our stories. So um, you know, working with our state associations, with um, our national associations, uh, doing everything that we can to keep the dialogue moving forward and, and being the one at the table who's brave enough to raise your hand and say, it's time for change. Um, uh, this uphill battle, pushing that big boulder up the hill constantly, proving our relevance. Um, let's stop doing that. Let's, let's be relevant and let's identify those outcomes and impacts in the data that tells our story and uh, let's let's move forward uh, from a, from a, a position of 
leveraging our assets rather than explaining our deficits. Absolutely. And just to add from the academic point of view, um, we feel totally in sisterhood with you, sisterhood and brotherhood with you. Uh, we feel like the data that we present to iPads and ACRL um, really doesn't reflect what we're doing. There are those quantitative numbers, volumes, and you know those that information really isn't telling. It it gives us kind of that so what feeling. You know these numbers don't reflect what we do day to day and how we improve the lives of our students and our faculty here. So um, I feel exactly the same way regarding the sorts of things that we report out. Um, our strategy has been to um, find these other avenues to share with people what we do and how we uh, create success here uh, with our students and faculty. Um, so yes, it's a conversation that all librarians, regardless of their type of institution that they're working for, all of us need to be having this conversation. Um, so, yeah, the revolution, perhaps, we can start it here. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and piggybacking on just really quickly on what Nancy's saying, you know, locally, every public library, you know, can, um, if, if you've gathered your data, and if you have um, gathered that qualitative data, can come up with some way locally to communicate your value to your stakeholders. And you know, that should happen regardless of uh, uh, the effectiveness of, of the state report. The reality in public library land of the state annual report is that's where stakeholders are going to get their information. And um, we, uh, we are kind of held hostage by that. Um, uh, when, when we go and we advocate on a state and, and national level, we need a better better indicators of, of our value to have uh, conversations that are more valuable, that, that better tell our story. And uh, in total agreement with Nancy, uh, I don't know that it matters how many people walk through the door. Or what is reference? How many reference questions? Well, what does it matter? Mm -hmm. You know, are, have skills been gained? Have lives, like Nancy said, uh, improved? have a, 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 in the individual lives in your community and the maybe collective life of your community. Has it improved as a result of the library? And uh, that's where, at least from my perspective, we need to be thinking to start to understand universally in the public arena what does success look like and then what are those impact and value measures that we need to collect and report out what do they look like. And uh, like I said, locally we can all kind of do that, but it, 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 and, and we should, but it doesn't address the more pressing uh, challenge of this national uh, uh, information that our stakeholders absolutely 100% go to to uh, determine our value. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for bringing that up. And it looks like we have one more question from Jean. She says, I'm a solo hospital librarian. Any ideas on how I can implement these ideas? I think there are a lot of free tools that one could use. I mean, even if all you have is simply a website to, to project some of this information, it's certainly a good starting point. Um, just Facebook. If Facebook is all you have, start there. It's free. It's accessible. Um, start a campaign for people to like your Facebook page. Uh, get people on board and looking there on a regular basis. Even something as simple as that is a really good starting point. Mm -hmm. so I think, any ideas? I think hospitals have a lot of restrictions on social media, but I do think some of those um, infographic tools could definitely be mm -hmm. used. Yep. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Sue and Nancy. Well, thanks oh. for having us. Our pleasure. And we'll be sending out a link to the recording and the slides as well as a follow-up survey. So I want to wish everyone a great day, and I will now end the recording. <laughs>